V3 implant system was introduced um, about a year ago, officially introduced about a year ago, and it's used by many, many dentists now. But it is a new system. So as new systems go, there's lots of questions coming up. And we do get these questions. Um, some things are serious, they really have to be pay, paid attention to. And since this is a, a prosthetic or restorative session, this will be the main course, talking about the restorative. But I want to talk a little bit about some issues that are um, surgery related, because they come up, people ask questions, and I'm sure the interest more than just the people who ask, but most of us are interested in these, uh, in these issues. And it'll be shorter, it'll be just the question and answer that we have for it, or explanation. So let's start. First thing that people say, so what, uh, the, the, the implant is so different, what should we worry about? What, what, should, we, uh, what should we be concerned with? But the truth is that the special thing about the V3 is that surgically there's nothing special about it. Because even though it has a strange head, a triangular head, the surgical procedure is just as you would have with any other implant. You would drill a hole, it'll be a circular hole, you'd place the implant, and it has mostly to do with um, the surgical protocol, okay? It has nothing to do with the head of the implant, not the surgical part. But there's still some questions when you look at the strange looking head of the implant, still some questions come up. The first one is people say, you say that with the V3 we get extra bone, so do we have to augment or not? Um, actually, augmentation has nothing to do with the shape of the implant. It has to do more with, what, with uh, your situation. And what you should do is what you always do. The small issue of the gaps we've been hearing is no problem at all, okay? The gaps would always fill with blood, and blood is the best matrix for, uh, uh, for, for, for bone formation, so we shouldn't worry about the gaps or having to cover them or fill them or anything like that. So augmentation in this respect has no need at all whatsoever. They always work the way we expect them to work. Um, these are maybe slides you've seen before. This is when you place the implant. Sometimes you don't, there's not enough blood right, right in the beginning, but maybe after a minute or two or maybe less, the gaps fill with blood, and this blood will change into bone in, a, in the best way, and this is how the, the um, implant works. Those gaps work. Uh, many times you'd have blood right from the beginning, and that's no issue at all, so you wouldn't be worried. In fact, all gaps around the implant, and these are not the only gaps we have. We have gaps all around the implant because the way we, um, we make our drilling today and the way the new implants are, uh, are designed, there should be a lot of gaps around the implant to be filled with blood because that, again, that gives us the best matrix for bone formation. And this is what happens around every implant today, mostly the more active implants, which are very common today. You wouldn't see that so much in the old cylindrical uh, the, the passive implants, but modern implants would have that. You'd have a lot of areas that have to fill with blood, and this is good. So if you have no blood, you're in, in a bad situation, regardless of this, it has nothing to do with the V, v implant. Uh, you need blood in the socket, obviously. The only thing is that with this implant, you see those cavities, because they're up, well, they're all the way up to the, uh, to the crest, and you can see that the area is a it has a gap, and it has to be filled with blood. So we kind of have a a way of telling if there's enough blood. Usually if we do it and there's no blood, we don't even know. And as far as augmenting bony defects and missing bone volumes, situations, or missing tissues, again, it has nothing to do with a V implant. It has to do with the situation and what you're used to doing. Some of us, as you've seen before, are very meticulous, very demanding of themselves, full of passion, and they want all they can get. You won't get it by just using the V. You'd have to augment your tissues. So in a situation like this, where there's a huge bony defect, obviously the V neck would not, has nothing to do with it. So you'd have to augment it and, um, and get your results. In this situation, with two V implants were placed, V3 implants were placed into extraction sockets, there's some missing bone around, and you have to do your regular calculations, how much 
of a cavity is there? Do you expect it to fill uh, spontaneously? Do you want to fill it? Do you want to cover it? Whatever you want to do, just do as you usually would do. And of course, the soft tissue. If you want the extra nice um, result like this, they don't come with no work. You have to do your augmentations. So that's for short. Sure. You have to augment. The extra bone that we give you doesn't do that for you. The other question that comes up in a surgical sense is where to place the, the flat surface. Okay, so this implant is not circular. It, it has points. It has areas that are different. Okay? It has the pointy parts and it has the flat surfaces. Where would you place these flat surfaces? Obviously, we want to place it where the extra bone is needed most. Or you, we want to have uh, more bone because these are, these are sensitive areas. We know the buckle plates are sensitive area, and that's where you pay most if you lose bone because of the outcome. So you'd, you'd, you're expected to place the flat surface towards the, uh, the, the area where you want it most. But we also have to consider a tissue volume and blood supply. Tissue, I mean bone tissue volume. Because um, sometimes you place the implants too close to each other and you say, ah, oh, then I'll face the, the flat surfaces toward each other. Well, I'm not sure this is the right way to go because if we look at this, we've seen this before in Leo's uh, lecture, but if we, if we see two adjacent V3 implants, and the, there's more blood supply coming in from the palatal aspect of the, of the jaw than it does, than it does from, the, from the buckle. So we would, this, is, this is an advantage. Having it such a wide open in the palate would do a lot of uh, good for the, for the bone between the two implants. So suggesting to place the, the two flat surfaces against each other, I think we pay a dear price where we have narrower buckle bone or something impinges on the buckle bone and you have less of a flow of blood from the aspect where there's more blood coming from the palatal. So I would say that even for adjacent implants, I think you'd get a better interproximal bone, inter-implant bone in the crest uh, if you place them like that. That's my opinion, and I um, usually want them that way. So the buckle is still, stay, still stays wide, wider than it would. The, this fine dotted line tells you where the same diameter implant would be if it was a full circular implant, much less buckle bone lift. So I would place the implants like that and rely on a lot of blood coming in from the palate, and I wouldn't worry about the smaller difference up at the top of the, of the triangle. The next issue is where to place, so the, where to place the fl uh, flat surface. The answer is, for me, mostly to the buckle. Even if they're adjacent implants, I would place it mostly to the buckle because that's where it's needed most, that's where the, the plate is most vulnerable, and that's what I think should be done, even in close, close implants. But it's up to you. What is the correct depth of placement? Well, like all implants with conical connections, that are considered safe bone-wise. You don't lose bone around good, good implants with good conical connections. You hardly lose any bone from the crest. So you'd, you'd place such implants, and V3 is no different, at the bone level or even slightly below the bone level, and you would have no problems. So the bone would just adhere to the surface of the implant all the way to the top, and it will not change. Most of the time, it will not change. Obviously, when you place implants between two teeth where the adjacent interproximal bone is still high, it'll seem that they're very, very deep. But on the buckle, you're probably where you want to place it, which is three millimeters below the, the CEJ or whatever your technique and your philosophy is. In x-rays, they would seem like they're very deep. Still, nothing would happen there in the sense that you would not lose bone. They will all look like this. So I would say, the answer to that would be at or a little below the crest. Obviously, crests are no flat surfaces. You would have crests having different anatomies, but you want to be, I would say, the entire top of the implant would be under the crest. That's a good, that's a good rule. You won't pay any, any, no damages with doing that. It always works. The last issue with surgical, uh, concerning the surgical-related issues is the uh, surgical protocol and initial stability. 
because we get questions about that. This is a new implant. It's a new implant system. And like any new implant system, uh, there's a learning curve. And surgically, as I said before, the fact that the head is triangular doesn't have to change anything with the surgical, uh, with the surgical technique. So there's nothing special about it. The company provides us with a brochure, a manual, of how to use the, the drills. It gives us a, a final drill with every, with every implant. But the, um, it also tells us that with the other implants that it gives out final drills, people use it in 20% of the cases. So I don't know if it's a good idea to provide it with every implant. If for newcomers to the systems, they think they have to use it every time because it says final drill. You, th you would think you'd have to use it, even though they mentioned that if it's hard bone, you have to use it all the way in. If it's softer bone, which is, we don't understand what softer bone means, but it, it is a whole scale of softer bone, use it partly, okay? So they know statistically that people with other systems, statistically people have used it in 20% of the cases. Not using it right in softer bone depends on how much uh, cortical or how much of a cortical layer you have, what goes on under the cortical layer, is it denser, less dense, the trabecular, the trabecular bone. And I would use discretion. I, don't, I wouldn't even call it final drill. I would call it hard bone drill. So you would use it in hard bone and not use it maybe at all in soft bone because if you have very soft bone and you have a thin cortical layer, if you have a problem penetrating the cortical layer, I would use, the company has uh, counter, countersink drills, I think. They're short and they are the, the, the right diameter to allow entrance into the cortical bone and they don't widen the, the, the trabecular bone. So I would use that. Um, stability gained from, from the, from the uh, softer bone, from the trabecular bone, has nothing to do with the head of the implant. It has to do with the design of the threads, design of the body, the way the body shaped and the protocol, the, the amounts of the, what drills you use and so on. So it's like any other system. There's a learning curve. If there is a cortical layer, the triangular head anchors very well into it. Uh, if you're missing that or it's very short or it's um, an immediate extraction situation or some bony defect, you have to rely on, on the uh, trabecular bone. I would use your, you know, your, I would use the common sense of what you would do in any other system. Just learn the system and, and be smart about using it. There's no, nothing different about this implant. And now let's get to the main course here, which is the prosthetics. Um, I'm not gonna talk about the prosthetic uh, system itself, different uh, solutions we have. I can just say it's a very comprehensive system and uh, it's a smart system. Uh, it's even maybe, as you'll see, may maybe a little too comprehensive in the sense that the company is used to, uh, came from an um, internal hex type connection, which a lot of, s or some solutions apply, and um, maybe some of the solutions, and they shifted the, all the solutions into the conical connection. That may have not been smart. It could maybe reduce and have some new some new um, solutions for the special for the conical connections, as you will see. But the way it is now, it's a very comprehensive system, a very smart system, and uh, you can do anything you want with it, CAD cams and all the, everything. It's it's a huge system. It's a big system for all solutions. The two issues I want to address regarding the uh, the prosthetic, the restorative phase. One is that all. All the abutments in the V3 system, they're all concave tulip-shaped abutments. We, now, we know why these are better, because they give more volume of soft tissue, so it stays there longer, it's better for the bone, and it's better for the outcome, and it's obvious now. We know that these are superior to just having bulky, uh, bulky abutments coming out of the implant and through the mucosa. But, a lot of people, a lot of MIS people haven't used, um, have not used concave abutments before. This is new to the company, and there's some things you should pay attention to. Obviously, if you do cemented uh, restorations, 
one thing is the extra care you should take with the excess cement. You place your crown a little bit subgingively. Unfortunately, sometimes it's a lot on subgingively, but some of the cement comes out the top and it's easy to clean, but a lot of the cement slides down, <coughs> slides down the uh, abutment and into the area of the bone and the top of the implant, and that is very bad. So first of all, it will be much harder to detect this kind of cement with concave abutments. They're very narrow under this white part. They're like tulips. And the other thing, <coughs> it'll be very difficult to remove. So pay extra attention. There are different solutions to that. Some people make vent holes. Some people just place very little cement or whatever you do. Should be close to the gum line, not so much if you do cement it. Not very deep under the gum line. Think about these things. The other thing is, <coughs> You have to use the right gingival height. The prosthetic height is also indicated, but it has nothing to do with this issue. Gingival height uh, is very important when you choose, when you work with concave uh, tulip-shaped abutments, because you want to take advantage of the narrow area as much as you can, for as high as you can. You want to be narrow for as high as you can. But you can't go beyond the gingival line with the um, with, with the, what we call the finish line, the, the, the connection to the crown, because if you, start, if you have to start working on it in the laboratory, you immediately lose platform width or platform size, it's because as you go down very, very little, you already become very, so if you, you should be very precise and choose, and the, the, um, the assortment is huge. You can choose and pick, I mean, it's, it's every millimeter or so uh, in the system. There's no problem, just check them and use the right height, the right gingival height. So you can take advantage both of the narrow areas for as high as you can and not go beyond. The main issue and the thing I want to sharpen most our understanding is the conical connection. Conical connections are known to be, we all know, it's common knowledge now, mechanically and biologically superior. Um, because of this, uh, the slope, and the, the, uh, the mechanical connection is much stronger. There's friction in there, and it's much stronger. And uh, biologically, it seals. It, many times, or most of the time, with good conical connections, there's actually a real seal. So bacteria coming in through the screw hole cannot penetrate into the tissues around the head of the implant, <coughs> which is the bone. So. Uh, it, is, it is known that it's superior. But it needs understanding and attention <clears throat> because a lot of people have not worked with it before. And I even see people who have worked with it with other systems. Uh, <clears throat> and some mistakes can be done. This, these are very important issues, and uh, we'll go through them now. The steep slope makes for a better connection, as I said, because you get, a, you get a better mechanical connection, and it's tight one. But it's geometrically more sensitive, and I'll explain. Some can have in, intuitively understand what we mean, but we'll go through it and explain. <coughs> I'll demonstrate what happens with a non-engaging component from the, uh, from the system, from the uh, V3 system. What happens when you place the, uh, uh, an abutment like that, a conical abutment, now it's one that doesn't engage the, the anti-rotation element there. We start at zero, the torque is zero in Newton centimeters. The cone touch is the first thing that happens, the cone touch, the cones touch, and that's a passive fit for this particular one, one abutment. And then you start tightening it, and I don't know if you see it because it's a very minute change, but it goes down a little bit. As you torque from zero to whatever your preference is, let's say 30 Newton centimeters, it happens with all conical connections. They all allow a slight vertical movement with force. In other words, as you tighten them more, they would go down more. That's, that's what they're all about, the friction and being able to go and make better and better connection. But you have to understand that. So there's, there could be a slight Vertic uh, vertical movement as you apply more force. This sh we should know this because when we take impressions, for instance, send them to the lab, they place them, they, we all have to use the same torque, otherwise, in truth, we don't get the same vertical location. 
So it's inherent to all conical connections. The other thing is that small horizontal changes <coughs> translate to larger vertical changes. This is regular uh, trigonometry. It's, um, since of, it's a uh, very uh, tight slope, very sharp slope. Um, if you make small horizontal changes, like the diameter of the, any abutment or the, or the analog or the implant itself, and that could happen because these, um, these items are manufactured and you have tolerances in manufacturing. Tolerances in manufacturing are very, very small. If you manufacture, in, if you have good manufacturing practices, the tolerances are very small but very, very small differences in horizontal in dimension translate to much larger, because of the, the angle, much larger differences vertically. Okay, that has to be understood. Now, that's true for all conical connections, any system, any make, any company. I want to mention one thing that people have encountered and experienced, and us too, with this particular conical connection that we get from MIS. It has to do with the engaging components. We use a lot of engaging components, the ones that go into the spline, okay? They fit into the spline so they can't rotate. Uh, there's some friction in the spline. It's not very much unlike the friction you would have with Zimmer implants, you know, the, with the, the hexagon has some friction in, in it. It doesn't just fall into place, you have to tighten it into place. So it's very similar. There's friction in the spline so what, would, what we'll see is that we place the abutment, it's zero nanocentimeters, no force yet, the spline touches, not the cones, the spline touch, the teeth of the spline. It, to some extent, they would go a little deeper, a little less, it has to do with the exact uh, dimensions, but it would stop at some point. And then you'd go into the, uh, roughly between zero and 10 uh, Newton centimeters and you, and, and until the cones touch. And that's a situation you should have started with if it was uh, non-engaging, okay? So the cone touch, you somewhere around 10 Newton centimeters, and then you do your tightening. So then you go from 10 or whatever, whatever it is, 5, 15, to 30, or whatever your preference is, and then the connection is tight, okay? You have to remember this because this is a sensation we get when we place the abutments, the engaging abutments, and some people ask about it. Why do we get that? Why do we have so much turning under, under torque. Which, this is the explanation. <clears throat> There's some friction, <clears throat> and you get, <clears throat> excuse me, and you get torque as the spline goes down. It's not much, it's around the 10, and then you tighten the, the, then the cone touch, and you tighten the connection, and you're where you want to be. So the main problem with conical connections is bridges because of these discrepancies that are, it's very sensitive to. Okay, let's first talk about cement retained bridges. We all know what cement retained bridges are. You place, you take impressions at the implant level, you attach them to analogs, and, you, and then they go to the laboratory, they're poured, you place abutments in them, then you create a bridge over them, and if it's modern, a zirconia bridge attached to um, tie bases. I'm sorry, this is cemented. So you'd cement it. I mixed it up. This is cemented. You'd create, you place abutments, create the bridge, then it goes back to the mouth. You use different torques. So there's a screw with the impression, there's, with the impression in the mouth as you take the impression with the um, abutments. Then there's a screw that you have to tighten as you go into the analogs. The analogs and the, and the implant could be a little, very slightly, hundreds of millimeter difference. Still, as I said, vertical difference would be more significant. Not much, but more significant. And then you tighten the abutments in, then you create a bridge, and then when you go back to the mouth, you probably have a cu accumulated inaccuracy of all these steps, and it may be significant. Now, it, altogether, it may be less than what we consider accuracy in cemented restorations, maybe 30, uh, uh, 30 microns or whatever, so, but it's, it's there. You should know it because you can get different res results or different look. When you look at it, it may look different in the lab and in the, uh, and in the mouth if you take x-rays. So that, that's the explanation for it, and it's true for all conical uh, systems. You, and if you do them that way, if you take 
implant level impressions and you go to the lab. What we could do instead, if you place the abutments first, and some systems only allow that, some conical connection systems, other makers only allow that, you, the abutments, uh, you tighten the abutments to the implants at the final torque, you don't remove them anymore. Then you take abutment level impressions and the analogs will be abutment analogs and you create the bridge and it's tight. There's no changes. There's no accumulated changes in the, in the accuracy. And then back to the mouth, you can cement it. And you don't use torques. Nothing, nothing could make any, cha any difference. And I, the company actually has a huge correct selection of C, what they call CPK, um, it's complete prosthetic kit. And what these are, are abutments that you would use that way. They come as a kit, and you would use it that way. You'd place the abutment, choose the right height. As I said before, it's important to pick the right height. Choose the right height, place them in, torque them down, use the different um, parts that you have to take the impression, send it to the lab. It'll be as accurate as the lab is, or as your impression is. It has, it, you will not suffer from the inaccuracies inherent into conical connections. So this is one solution. A solution that the, uh, the company gave us for taking Im implant level impressions and eliminating one of the steps of inaccuracy is the, tra the impression transfers are not, don't engage the cones in this 12 degree, they go, they're like 45 degrees, so they would stop more abruptly and more accurate. Uh, so that cuts one inaccuracy in the chain that we talked about before, if you take implant level uh, uh, implant level uh, impressions. So this is a solution uh, that a lot, a lot of the, most of the other systems use, the others, other conical connection systems use, which is you place the abutments and you pick abutment level impressions. Then there's no inaccuracies. The next issue is what well, most of us do most of the time is screw retain bridges. And with screw retained bridges, we still have to remember that vertical inaccuracies are inherent to all conical connections. And many systems don't even allow what I'll show you now, but the MIS system does, maybe since it's shifted its parts from the, uh, fr from the internal hex to this system, it has a large variety of uh, available parts that would allow some things that I urge you not to do, okay? So let's go through it. With implant level screw retained bridges, what you do is you take implant level impressions. Okay, these are the bridge, the three implants. You have to attach them to, an, to the analogs. Again, same, same process, screws. Then you create a framework, let's say a zirconia framework, and you attach, you, you bond, you cement the, 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 tie, the tie bases to the framework in the lab. This is what happens most of the time. And then, back to the mouth, okay, you have the zirconia bridge, the tie bases are cemented to it, and you'd expect it to just fall into place. What we know is passive fit, but we know passive fit from flat connections like external hex or many times not so bad passive fits with 45 degree connections like internal hex. But it will not happen here. Because as I mentioned, small horizontal changes translate to much larger vertical changes. And this is what happened. I don't know if you can see the slight movement in the leftmost abutment. And that translates to a larger, a larger vertical discrepancy. And also, it touches the side of the, the, side of the, uh, of the, con of the cone the cone on the implant, and lateral inaccuracies are easy to force down and cause very tight stress, very high stresses, okay? Because of the slope again, it's a very steep slope, 12 degrees, it's like you would use it for raising or lifting uh, heavy loads. Is the, 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 the smaller the degree, the, 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 the smaller the, the slope, or the steeper the slope, if you look at it from the other direction, um, it's easier to, to push things up, the, up, this, um, up the slope. So this is 12 degrees. It's very easy to push down, even though you have 
you already hit one of the sides because you have a discrepancy. You hit one of the sides, and it's easy to force it down with the screw. And this could be uh, uh, very high stresses on the side. And this could spell potential cat catastrophe. And it has to happen to people with conical connections that do this. Okay? They connect outside the mouth, and they put it in the mouth, and they screw it in. What you could do instead is if you really want to use this system on the implant, sir, on the implant uh, level, you could uh, first place the abutments and torque them down to final torque, because that would change too if you don't do it right. Let's say 30. Then you cement the zirconia bridge over them. Then you remove the bridge and clean the, clean the cement, do whatever you have to do to polish the abutments and so on. And you cement it back at the same torques you did before. This is quite a lot of work, and it's not what you intended to do. The laboratory want to, wants to cement. You want the laboratory to cement the connections. You want to have full bridge placed in the mouth, easy. So the only way that it will work and be totally passive is this way, if you want to go into the connections, into the conical connections. And there's no way you can do it if you use those uh, gold plastic cylinders where you use for PFMs and you cast them outside the mouth. Okay, you take impressions, implant level impressions, you cast them outside the mouth, and then you'd expect them to fit in the, in the conical connections. They will not fit in the conical connections in what we call passive fit. It'll seem that way. By the way, it's very difficult to tell that it's not all touching and all perfect because these are slopes, and in x-rays you can't really tell. If it's a flat surface, like external hex, you can tell. Some touch, some don't touch. It's very easy to tell. Here, it's not easy to tell. So highly un not recommended. So for multiple connected screw-retained restorations, we say you have to use flat connections. Some people, we have the multi-unit system, which we'll talk about in a second. Some people use implant, still want to use implant-level systems. But for implant level systems, you have to, as we say, recommend use flat surfaces. So the, the company came up with a solution that some companies do have, and that is sit on, this, on the horizontal flat surface on top of the connection. So you don't go into the connection with a cone, just some guiding part, short guiding part. It doesn't touch the cones, so everything is guided into place. But the abutments, the whole system, it's uh, from taking the impressions, healing, the abut healing abutments so you don't impinge the gums later, healing abutments, uh, uh, taking impressions, abutments for temps, abutments for tie bases, and so on, the whole system. They all rest. We call them uh, implant-level screw-retained bridges, with the bridge system. They all rest on the flat surface on top of the implant. So there will be... No mistakes. All the mistakes, all the problems with conical connections will not happen. The system is not out now, but it will be out very shortly, I understand. And the regular solution for using flat surfaces is the multi-unit system. It also has another advantage vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the, the previous one, which is you tighten into the cone. So you get all the biological advantages of conical connection. You don't remove them again. By the way, there's mostly, if you don't use... The, uh, if you don't use the angulated ones, there's no screws going in. You get very narrow abutments. Uh, the platform shifting is still there. You don't get that with the bridge components that I showed you before. But people who want to use implant level bridge, they are the ones you should use. So with multi-unit uh, system, uh, multi -unit systems, it's, it's very vast in, uh, in the MIS system. Um, the, the prosthetic the com component is vertically 100% accurate because it's a flat surface. You cannot tighten it more. You won't go any, f any further. Uh, when you place a bridge, there are no accumulated vertical discrepancies because there is no difference in vertical movement. OK, so if there's a bridge, there's different, di different abutments, there will, no, there will be no uh, accumulated vertical discrepancies. It's tolerant to horizontal inaccuracies, OK? If the, one of them is not totally horizontally proper because of some lab problems or any other problems, nothing will happen. It just moves on the flat surface to where it needs, and there's no stresses. 
and the lateral forces don't apply. They don't damage this. There's no lateral forces. Okay, this shows the bridge. We've talked about it. Most likely a passive fit. Even if there's a small horizontal inaccuracy, again, there's a slight movement there. I'm not sure you saw it. Still, most likely a passive fit. If everything else is accurate, your impression taking, the creating of the, of the bridges, and so on. So we went through some surgical, surgery-related issues and prosthetic issues. And the, the message here is you have to know the system, understand it, and use your common sense. That's in the surger, surgical part and the restorative part. And I can tell you that after four years of using the V concept, okay, before V3, we had the V concept implants as prototypes and so on. We've been using them for four years. Uh, they really deliver. They really do a good job. The outcome is amazing. And thank you. Thank you very much.